Good afternoon, everybody. This is Matt. I'm Christian. Um, Matt, 20 years on, you are no longer the insurgent. You are very much the establishment. <laughs> and what a turbulent year it's been. How, how does it feel in your shoes right now? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I think, you know, a birthday is always a moment for reflection, and 20 years uh, is a long time. And I think I would say two things that I feel, and I think we feel at Google. On the one hand, um, a renewed energy for the mission, organizing the world's information to make it helpful, useful for everyone. Um, we're at the moment where we finally get to the majority of people being online for the first time uh, next year at some point. And so from our perspective, there's an opportunity to help everybody with all the tools you just saw uh, to make the most of that opportunity. But equally, I think you know we're different. Uh, we have to be a responsible innovator. And when we started, it was all about users put the user first, and I think we have to take responsibility for users, but also society, the businesses that depend more and more on the web, many of the people here who are building businesses uh, and thriving as a result of that technology. So renewed energy, but a sense of the need to be responsible as an innovator. And have you found that being a tech company isn't as different to being an ordinary company as we perhaps thought 20 years ago? And the internet is a lot more like the real world, the physical world, than we also thought. Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um, it was great that Tim Berners-Lee was here at the beginning of the week. You know, he built the web for everyone. And we're now in a situation where we're going to get towards everyone being there. And it's a bit like electricity. You know, it was a specialist thing in the early days. And now we rely on it to do lots of stuff. And I think the same is true of the internet. Overwhelmingly positive. But there are issues that come with how it's used by all sorts of actors that we have had to grapple with and society has to grapple with as well. Um, there, there are a load of issues that Google has been in the news about over the last few months, including today, which I think we should run through. I mean, the, the competition commissioner was here earlier today talking about Google again, saying the third investigation into AdSense is nearly complete. Strong suggestion that you're going to be hit with another massive fine and saying you've done loads of great things, mm -hmm. but you're stifling competition and they've got to, you've, you've got to be stopped. Yeah, look, I think... Um, what I want us to do is to be a key part of how Europe can be successful in the internet world, the digital world. And we have to engage with regulators and policymakers and abide by their decisions as they define the rules that they want to have here. So I think in, in the context of what we're doing on Android and shopping, uh, we have complied with what the Commission has asked us to do. Uh, even though we believe that what we are doing, you know, overwhelmingly on Android, people have got more choice than ever before. Hundreds of different manufacturers making thousands of different of phones. But we have to do what we're asked to do by the Commission, and that's what we're doing. Are you going to pay those fines? Uh, uh, Is that money ever going to be coughed up? Yeah, we have to pay the fines. We have also lodged an appeal because we do believe that you know, Android has produced amazing choice for consumers. And the, and the commissioner has recognized that. Uh, the way that it was funded is something they asked us to change, and, and that's what we've done. So you know, we want to be on the side of people who want to make the most, most of the web. We want to be in a position where we can help businesses grow and startups to grow. And it's up to us to engage with policymakers. And where they decide on new rules, we have to respect those. Ideally, we can be in the conversation. And many of the people here, I'd encourage to be in the conversation about the rules we want. Um, and that's why we are proud to sign up to Tim Berners-Lee contract uh, that he uh, launched uh, this week and, and to support the Web Foundation uh, in making sure that the web uh, works for the next three billion people to come online too. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned that. Let's just deal with it then. I mean, what, what do you think the contract for the web can actually deliver? I mean, what is the point of it if everybody doesn't sign up to it? I think it's something where if you can uh, ensure that people are aware of what it takes for the web to remain open, and useful for everyone. It helps you, and, and he's gave nine principles we don't have a chance to go into here, but I think for governments and technology companies and content creators to recognize what you need to do for the web to continue to work well for everyone, for it to have useful information. Uh, for example, you know, in the case of journalism, to ensure that quality content can be found and can thrive online. These are important responsibilities. The, I mean, one of the most shocking images of the last few days has been the sight of Google workers walking out of Google buildings around the world. I mean, as a, as a man who's worked at Google for more than 10 years, what was your instinctive reaction when you saw that? Well, when I read the stories in the New York Times that led to this, I was as disappointed as anybody else. And um, you know, I think it's not good enough. And I think we need to change what we're doing. So 
I fully supported people who walked out. This is around the world. Many colleagues um, protested about what they'd read and said we need to change and take action. And I fully support that. I believe that we have to do better. Uh, and we should recognize this moment, reflect on it, and look at what we can do to improve how we operate. I mean, what, what they had read was that a senior Google executive had been given a huge payoff despite allegations of misconduct. And you're saying you didn't know about that? I didn't know about that. This was a, at a very senior level, and I was as surprised as everybody else and as disappointed. It was and wrong. As determined, yeah, and determined to see change. It was wrong. Our, C our CEO has uh, apologized to the company and uh, has also supported people who are making known their concerns. I think the people who made uh, those protests did it in a very thoughtful way. We all want Google to be a, a great culture. We see that it has no place uh, at Google. And actually, not just Google, but the technology industry as a whole has to build products that work for everyone, has to be an industry in which everyone can be welcome and work well, and we have to do better. But what, what some of the people who organized the walkout said was that Google talks a great game and talks like that, but when it comes to the culture in the business, you're not delivering it. I think that, that has to be true. And I've, been, I've listened to many of those people. I've sp spent time with many of those people in the last week. And many around uh, my region have uh, m made those voices heard. And I think they're right. We have to do better. And uh, I and other members of the management team need to look at what we can do, not just in terms of, you know, obviously, there's bad headlines around very bad cases. But actually, it's the everyday behaviors uh, and the everyday standards that we hold ourselves accountable to that are important as well. Because, I mean, obviously, the, the question you always get asked, or any Google executive gets asked, is how you can live up to don't be evil. Um, one of the other things that they were worried about or concerned about was um, what the company has been doing. So the secret project for China and that search engine. Mm. So much in contrast to Google's principal position to come out of China. Mm. How did that happen? Yeah. So. A couple of things I'd say. Firstly, it, it, the, the culture uh, is also one that's very open and very transparent. And we have a lot of quite heated debate amongst employees. And it's something that we guard quite jealously that we are able to have those discussions. It's also true that we don't run the company by referendums, um, which is probably a good thing, speaking as a Brit. Um, and therefore, there is debate and there is discussion. Uh, in the case of China, actually, we've been operating in China. We have a team in China. Android's very popular in China. We also help Chinese businesses export. Um, and, and this was um, a comment, if you want to know more, Sundar, our CEO, did an interview with Wired about this, I think, last week. We're just looking at what would it look like if we were oper operating there today. Uh, not that we have an intent to go in, but it's just part of our normal looking at how the business runs, how has China changed. But is, is Google or has Google built a search engine that complies with Chinese censorship? Uh, in the past, we did. So we were in China, I think, from about 2006 to about 2010. So we did have a search engine that showed these results have been removed by requirement of your government. The belief at that time was, even though that was censored, that it um, gave Chinese consumers access to much more information than, than the domestic engines did. But we pulled out, and we haven't built something to go back in. Right, OK, so that's not going to happen. Yeah, and I'm not responsible for what we do in China, so I'm just sort of telling yeah. you what we've been said. What about AI for the Pentagon? Did that come as a surprise to you as well? This is another case where employees raise concerns about what are we doing. And actually, it led to us publishing a set of AI principles that lay out much more clearly how we think we want to look at AI and what we do in the field of AI. And I think it's something, again, where it's not just Google that needs to do this. The industry and society needs to think about these things and think about them early. So what we said was we're not going to work on AI as it relates to weaponry, but we are going to work on AI that we think can be a force for good. And you can read those principles. They're available online. And we've encouraged people to comment and contribute and help us think about what we do there. So have you found, though, do you think, as a, as a huge global business, that it is harder to stick to those ideals than it seemed 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 11 years ago when you joined? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, look, I think the, the values remain the same, which is, you know, first and foremost, we want to put users first and, and provide products that really work for them. But as I said, I think we acknowledge you've got a broader set of responsibilities to a broader set of stakeholders. And also, technology is working at an accelerating pace. And we can't foresee the consequences of all the to tools that we and others build and put out there and how they will be used by everybody. So I think it is a much more complicated environment. I spend more of my time now talking to policymakers and 
society uh, in, in general about how can technology be harnessed for good and what are the things which we need to do together to have a framework that works for technology. So an example at the moment would be copyright. So anybody working in a business here needs clear rules on copyright. There's a directive before the EU at the moment. Um, and in the extreme version of its draft would make it quite difficult for links to operate in the same way as they do today online. So if you're a journalist um, producing news and sharing it online, the intent is to help quality content thrive. But the unintended consequences of the draft at the moment could mean that uh, actually it's harder to find high quality content. So it's important that people get those right. And that's why we want to speak up and encourage others here to be part of that discussion about the rules we need for technology to work for good for everyone. Just the, the last sort of internal culture area I wanted to raise with you was another thing that, again, a lot of Googlers have raised is why and how you get to a position where you're making your people go to forced arbitration. You know, what, why, as a culture, did you seek to stifle their rights and deal with it all quietly and internally? So I think this is a US-specific thing, um, and you know, it's not something that I've been responsible for. I think, again, if you go back to the concerns that employees have, they want to ensure that everybody is held to a high standard, that the standard is actually higher for senior people, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, and that if there are complaints or issues that they're dealt with fairly and independently, and I think that's something where we have to look again and say, what can we do to ensure that that trust is there and that we're working every day to ensure that it's a place where everybody can feel secure and safe. So those kind of rules don't apply in Europe? I don't, you, I don't you, think it's a European thing. And I've, I've been involved in various of these things over, the, over time, and that's not something that I've seen us do. OK. Well, I mean, let's, let's broaden this a little bit then to the next I don't know, can we talk about the next 20 or where, where is your horizon? When you think about the future, how far ahead do you think? I think we've always tried to think in terms of long term trends. Um, for example, you know, th th there's a video of Sergey talking in about 1998 about mobile devices and the mobile internet becoming the most important factor. So I think our founders have always had a look at what are the big uh, trends. And if you think today, where, where are the big trends? I think the first is the one that uh, Tim Berners-Lee emphasized, which is we're going to go from a world where being connected is a minority sport to a world where almost everybody is online quite quickly. This is revolutionary. It's overwhelmingly positive to have access to information, education, ideas, creativity. So the first big trend is you know everybody comes online. And I think when everyone's connected, the creativity that can happen is uh, phenomenal. It will also be the case that different cultures are online with different values, and that will give all of us pause for thought to think about how do we reflect those in the right way. So the first big trend, I think, is everyone connected and probably five or 10 times as many devices connected as there are people. What does that allow us uh, to do as a society? How do we want that to work for good? I think the second trend is how machine learning is changing what machines can do. And that leads to things like the AI principles that I mentioned earlier. You know, early manifestations of that are things like, um, if I look at Google Translate, the quality of what we can do has gone up significantly in the last couple of years. But more than that, we can give you more accurate translations from fewer data points and less data cost. And that means that somebody with a low-end smartphone with um, very limited affordability of data can actually get the same service as you and I enjoy uh, today. And I think that kind of thing means that people will get smarter tools that work for them. So I think AI and how we use that to build smarter tools that work for everyone and how we think about the tram lines for AI is going to be important. And then I think the third thing that I you know, think really is changing is the way we learn. You know, so I've got children, and uh, they are going out into the world of work for the first time they could work for until they're 80 or 90. And it's very clear, you know, when I started, when I, when I graduated actually from university, it was the same year that Tim Berners-Lee wrote the memo that led to the creation of the World Wide Web, which is going to turn 30 uh, next year. And I've spent the last 15 or 20 years working in jobs that wholly depended on the invention of the World Wide Web. So I think what we have to do is see uh, ways of people gaining skills that help them be productive. Um, one of the things we've done in Europe that I'm really proud of is launched a program to train people in basic digital skills. We've now trained 3 million people in how to build websites, use analytics, help companies grow. Many of them gone on to get new jobs, start businesses, and be productive. So I think we're going to look at ways to do more of that over time. This time yesterday, I had Chris Wiley, the, yeah. the Facebook whistleblower, or the, the Cambridge Analytical, uh, Analytical whistleblower sitting there. He was warning about precisely this scenario. You know, his message is, be careful. What kind of world do we want? And 
in that connected world that you've mm. described in which everything's talking to each other, we risk losing our agency, we risk, risk losing control of our lives, and we risk creating godlike figures. You know, Google will become an all-seeing, all-knowing global company that knows exactly where I'm going, what I want, what's in my fridge, when I need to shop. Is that something that dehumanizes me? Look, I mean, e even as you say it, you, you, you know that that's a big, big, big stretch. Um, I think how, how we think about this at Google, and I can only speak for, for Google, I think other tech companies have different approaches, is everything starts from you as a user of a service. Are you secure in using that service? Is it protected from other people hacking into your data? Once you've got security, you can then have control over privacy. You can decide what you share with whom where. And I think we've always had that at the heart of what we do at Google. Actually, it's the heart of what GDPR is intended to do, give, give people control, give people transparency. And um, we have a site called My Account. You can go to Google, look at My Account, see what services you've opted into, how you're sharing data. And 20 million times a day, people go to that site. And with one switch, you can turn off, for example, personalized advertising. You can decide how you share data with services. And what we see is that people like to be informed about what they have and like to be in control. So I think I would say that we only work with your permission. We need to make it easy for you to understand the range of services on offer and how you can decide how to use them. And you know, something that, that uh, the World Wide Web Foundation has pushed very hard is that make sure that users have that sort of transparency control. That's at the heart of our relationship with users. And if we don't have that, we don't have something to offer. But do you think we always know what's good for us? I mean, as, as parents, we are constantly arguing about screen time for children yeah. on a very, very basic level. Do we really understand what we're walking into? I think that's a really good question, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important that you have forums like this where you have policymakers coming together with people who are starting exciting new businesses, with people who are running you know, technology businesses and have a little more experience of that over time, and how these things come together. Because I think society ultimately has to decide on the norms in, in these places. Some of them will lead to rules, as we see. Um, some of them will lead to just socially acceptable ways of behaving, and some of it absolutely is about education. And I think what we want to do is make it easy for people to inform themselves about some of these things. And some of this stuff is quite hard to explain. You know, we work incredibly hard on our security and privacy policies to make them understandable in plain language to everyone. And if they're not simple enough to understand, we have to go back and simplify them. Do, do you want more rules? Do you want a clearer framework? I mean, in Britain, we've just seen a new tax, another new tax yeah. aimed at, you know, they call it a Google tax. It's aimed at your company's based on your revenue, other, companies around, other countries around Europe are trying to do mm. similar things. Um, are, you, are you happy to just go along with whatever the politicians can agree on? Yeah, look, I think on something like tax, it's very clear. The, the rules have to be set by the politicians, and if they want to change those rules, we have to obey them, and that's what we've always said. We'd like tax to be reformed so it's simpler, makes more sense to the person in the street, but all we can do is comply with the rules. Because you accept it doesn't really make sense at the moment. Well, I think it's, it's complicated. You know, tax that you pay as a person is different from the way tax is applied to companies. International companies have different rules. However, what we want to focus on is building great products and innovating and helping people make the most of the technology. And to the question about rules, I think there are areas where more rules and better regulation can really help. So, for example, I think about our experience on YouTube in the last couple of years, um, the abuse of that platform by violent extremism and hate speech, what we did was say, well, this is unacceptable. We have to have some rules that define what is acceptable to be hosted on a platform. And we went out and worked with experts, um, getting on for 50 different uh, NGOs and other types of experts to define policies to try to sort of uh, be more clear about what should be allowed on the platform and then train machines and humans to be able to enact those policies and try to be quite public about that, to have a discussion about where should one draw the line. So I do think there are places like that where more rules and more clarity help. We don't want to be the policemen. We need to be the people who are putting in place the rules that society wants. And by trying things, giving people tools to experiment and then engaging, I hope that we can do that better and better over time. And how can you engage with the users to bring them into that conversation as yeah. well? So, so obviously, one of the ways is to provide them with controls and tools and education and see what people do. I mean, people often think, you know, Google's all about the algorithm, and at the heart, what we do is search. But every time somebody searches, they decide, you know, what to do next, and that gives us a signal on how to improve. So actually, 
every interaction with a service is an opportunity to learn and improve that service. And of course, we also do things where we sit down and talk to people and look at what they do and listen to them as well. Uh, I, you know, I find that fascinating to go to Africa and do that in some of the countries which are just getting along uh, online for the first time and hearing what the challenges are there. So I think, yeah, one of the things we have to do is get better at listening, but it doesn't mean to say not just you know, listening to people in public, but actually seeing how they're using products. Just finally, I mean, as I say, it's, it's been a year in which privacy and data and tech has been right at the center of the news, and it, a lot of it has been negative. Mm. Do you feel you have been, I mean, has Facebook given you all a bad name? Well, um, I do think that it's very easy for the headline writer to group together technology companies. And we actually do all have quite different models. But I also think that these issues are big issues, and all of us need to address them and have our own responses depending on what, you know, on what we do. Um, I think it's important. One of the things I enjoy about my job, but it's also challenging, is to engage in these conversations and to be out there showing up and being part of the discussion and the debate. And you mentioned at the beginning you know, some of the competition cases in the European Commission. At the same time, we're part of the EU Internet Forum, looking at how you fight uh, terrorism online. We uh, win awards from the European Commission on digital skills training and helping people skill up for the future. We're part of various bodies and forums where we're trying to help people understand how technology can be used and harnessed for good. And I think I'd encourage everybody to be a part of that kind of discussion so that we can together figure out how to harness these new tools in, in a way that's highly productive and creates that opportunity. Matt Britton, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You everybody. Thank you.